Razor. Rose email in front of me about what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nothing like waiting until the last minute. Yes, but you can just read it. No one will know. Okay, I see one person with the phone number raising their hand, so it does work. Um, but we will open it for questions after the presentation. Okay, we're live on YouTube. Terry, remind me again, if somebody's on the phone, they can dial star nine? Yes. To raise their hand? Yes, and then we will open their line so they can ask their question. But I would have I would have to call on them by their phone number then, right? Uh, yes, but we, you know, as people raise their hand, it comes in order. So we, we should be able to see who's at the top and I'll just take it from there. Okay. Yeah. Picky panelist over here. So have we started to let people in or not yet? Yeah, oh yeah, people, we have uh, 40 people in, 41. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, um, so should we go ahead and get started? You wanna, Sabrina, wanna give everybody another minute? I think we should give everyone another minute. You know, it's just 401 right now. Okay. Um, Okay, I think we should go ahead and get started. As I said last time, I'm the first one to speak. And so <laughs> anything that gets cut off is the, uh, the uh, less intellectual part of the call. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the second of our community engagement sessions for the draft generic environmental impact statement uh, for the form-based code for the Chappaqua Hamlet. Um, I have a couple of things I just want to say at the top of the call, and then I'm going to turn things over to our Director of Planning, Sabrina Charney Hall. Um, first, as you all know, we are working on rezoning the Chappaqua Hamlet. This is consistent with the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 2017. Um, and our goal is to encourage mixed use and residential development to diversify our housing options and revitalize our small businesses simply by putting more feet on the street. We are mindful of the need to preserve our quaint small town and our form-based code will include design guidelines that will not only do that, but will also improve the aesthetics of the Hamlet to ensure that we have a beautiful, cohesive, consistent look and feel to our Hamlet. I'm really thrilled <laughs> that so many residents are engaged in the planning for the future of our Hamlet. Um, and it's great, it's really truly wonderful that we have so many people with us for this engagement session today. As I said before, this is the second of three sessions that the town board is hosting, actually prior to our public hearing on the DGEIS and the form-based code. And the purpose of these community engagement sessions is to be able to educate residents on the proposed zoning changes, to engage with you, to hear your comments and your feedback, and we're doing so, the town board, with open hearts and an open mind, and we're asking you to give us the same. I remain confident and optimistic that if we approach this with a curiosity about what's possible for our Hamlet, 
that we will ultimately create zoning legislation and a form-based code that will result in a better and more vibrant future for our community. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Sabrina Charney Hall. She's our Director of Planning. Um, she is going to give a brief presentation on the subject matter for today's community engagement session, after which we will have, again, a public comment and question session. Um, we have been taking attendees in terms of the order of people raising their hand. You can raise your digital hand on Zoom. Um, and that will, will then bring you in as a panelist so that you can ask your question uh, to, uh, to Sabrina um, and to the town board, which is, uh, we're all on the call today. Everyone's joining us here. Um, for those of you who are on the phone, I was just asked to give the instruction that if you want to ask a question at any time to dial star nine, which is the way that when you're on your phone, as opposed to on uh, the, uh, the Zoom platform, uh, that you're able to raise that digital hand and we will uh, announce your phone number when we are bringing you in so that you can then ask your question. Um, so with all that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Sabrina um, and I'll be back to, to engage with folks um, when we get to the question and answer period. So Sabrina. Okay, well, thank you, Ivy. And, and thank you to find in today to learn about the Chappaqua Hamlet form-based code and the draft generic environmental impact statement. As the town supervisor had indicated, this is the second public engagement session. Um, this public engagement session will focus on visual and transportation impacts as discussed in the draft generic environmental impact statement. And we have a third upcoming public engagement session on October 15th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. in the morning to focus on alternatives to the form-based code. And, and what that means is alternatives in, in different options underneath the form-based code. Um, so just putting a shout out for the for those that next event, um, all of these public engagement sessions are being recorded and are available for replay at your leisure at chapquaforward.org. So um, with that, I'm going to start a slide presentation. I will try and, and kind of keep this uh, lively and brief to keep your attention. So as I said before, the DGEIS is housed at chapquaforward.org. Onto the sidebar on that website, there are different tabs. One of them is for the draft generic environmental impact statement. If you click on that, you will see all 11 documents, which include the actual DGEIS as well as the appendices that contain background analyses that are very important to the actual document. So all of that will, is found on that website. How did we get here? So, you know, this is a big question. There's there's a lot of chatter out there. You know, why are we doing this now during the pandemic? Well, go back to the early, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014. That's when the town first started looking at gathering together a steering committee to help update the town's comprehensive plan. We did a, a tremendous amount of outreach between 2012, 2013, 2014 in meeting with the community, having the community help us with our background analysis of the existing comprehensive plan and having them tell us what you like about your community, what you didn't like about your community. And for those things that you didn't like about the community, how would you make it better? All of these conversations are cataloged in the 2014 public engagement report. In 2017, we came out with our actual document or in, in our case, a website that housed the comprehensive plan update, a framework for the community. In 2018, the town board issued a moratorium. There was a lot going on. Um, there was a lot of pressure for um, property owners to obtain variances, to put in uses that may or may not be consistent with the code. So the town board issued the moratorium to help us get a handle on how we need to amend our zoning to meet the needs of today and to implement the comprehensive plan. 
In 2019, the town hired a consultant team to help us look at our code, create a draft, draft a new code, and to work with the town and an appointed work group to, to create what we're looking at today. The consultant team consists of Kimley Horn, Tortagallis and Partners, the Real Estate Solutions Group or REST Group, and Joel Russell Esquire. So these are the folks who have been working with us on preparation of the proposed legislation. In 2019, we also held outreach meetings based on, um, based on documents that the consultant team was preparing and working with the downtown working group. So we held those meetings with emergency services, with the business community, with the historical society, the chamber of commerce, you name it. We met with them to get some feedback on what was going on today in their worlds. In 2019, also, as I had mentioned, was the downtown working group. This was um, a, a specific group of people consisting of the town board, three members of the planning board, um, a, a, a resident architect, as well as a couple of members of the development community to all work together to try and create a code that will best fit for us. We then continued doing community outreach and meetings between 2019 and 2020. And then at the end of 2019, we had a draft code that became the subject of this DGI, DGEIS. So that is what I'm going to present to you today. So that's where we came from. This is where we are today. So this is more immediate. These are the, the, the kind of Pin, the benchmark of points in time be aware of. I don't want you to think that the town board is ready to make a decision tomorrow on this. There's a process that we are following. So on September 25th, the town board accepted the draft generic environmental impact statement as complete um, for public review. It doesn't mean it was complete as far as content or substance, but it was accepted as being co complete enough for the public to begin their review of the document. On September 29th, we held our first public engagement session. We're here today on October 8th for our second engagement session. We'll be with you next week on October 15th for our third and final public engagement session. On October 20th, that is the date where the town board will open the public hearing on the, D, the draft generic environmental impact statement and the proposed legislation, the form-based code. The opening of the public hearing signifies a comment period that begins where you as a community member can submit written comments and questions on the DGEIS. Now, some of you have been asking me for information up until this point, and I've been pointing you to different locations in the DGIS to help you in your quest for information. If, if you still cannot find what you are looking for, or you think something is missing from this DGEIS, the opening of the public comment period is that point in time where if you submit a comment, whether it be through a session like this, through an email, or through written correspondence, your comments will be recorded into the public record and anything substantive is required by New York State law to be addressed through what's called a, a final environmental impact statement. Okay, so I know some of you have been extremely communicative in where you need to, you would like to find information in the DGEIS. I can only lead you so far. Please do not give up. We need to hear your comments and what you feel so that we can create a final environmental impact statement that really addresses all of the impacts that we may see happen under this form-based code. So October 20th, if, the, if you're going to do nothing else except go to that public hearing, submit something on October 20th, please. So after the public hearing is open, there's still several steps that the town board needs to take in order to consider adoption of legislation. There has to be submission of uh, the actual final environmental impact statement, and that needs to go through a process to make sure it has addressed all of the substantive comments that were received through the public hearing process. The town board will also need to make uh, an environmental determination. Are there significant impacts due to adoption of the proposed form-based code? And that will result in environmental findings. 
When all of that is done, then they will have the opportunity to consider whether or not to adopt the proposed legislation in its current form or as an amend in an amend amended form, which we don't know what that looks like right now. So that kind of outlines in a real general way of all of the steps that still need to occur for the town board to consider this legislation. So for those of you who didn't attend the last session, I, I want to identify for you and some and I apologize, some of these are repeat slides for new members in, in our audience. Um, here's the study area. The study area runs from um, from Washington Avenue um, in front of Town Hall, all the way up to Bischoff Avenue. It goes up King Street, um, partway up the hill. And it also includes the area by Walgreens um, and Talbot buildings, that kind of commercial clutch right at the top of King Street. So this is the study area. In 2017, when the town adopted the framework for the future of Newcastle, it included 48 goals. Those goals ran the gamut of um, be a cleaner, greener community, incorporate increased green building standards, protect our streams and rivers, uh, our streams and our water bodies, our wetlands. It also talked about our residential neighborhoods and it talked about our commercial areas. There was a lot of discussion about preserving our single family neighborhoods. There was a lot of discussion about sidewalks. There was also a lot of discussion of how we should develop in the future. It was very important and one of the strongest set of policies in that comprehensive plan resolve around this bottom bullet, locate higher density residential development in the hamlets with density of development decreasing as distance from the hamlet centers increases. This is a general statement. The comprehensive plan breaks it down further to talk about any new density in town should occur where the town has the infrastructure to support density should occur where we can protect our trees, where we can protect our steep slopes, where we can protect our wetlands and our water bodies. So that is kind of the foundation where this zoning came from. Let's talk about zoning. This is the existing zoning in the Chappaqua Hamlet. It consists of the planned industrial area, which is the back parking lot to the train station and the town hall property. There's the business retail area, which is a little bit on South Greeley, but mainly consists of rec field and around the train station. There's a business retail parking, which is behind the existing businesses today. And then we also have another business retail area that goes up King Street and up a little bit on North Greeley. If you look at Upper King Street, you have a planned business area, the BD, and then again, you have another general business retail area, the business retail um, surrounding that BD property. This is the existing zoning. The existing zoning is what's called Euclidean zoning or used-based zoning. If you wanted to put a nail salon into the, our existing commercial area, that is a use in our zoning code that says you can. If today you wanted to put a video store in the Hamlet, you couldn't. It's not a use that is outlined in the zoning code. Today, our zoning code requires in these commercial areas that the first floor of every building is a commercial use. You'd say to me, but Sabrina, there are houses going up King Street. Sabrina, there's there's no there's there's residential on North Greeley. Yes, those properties are, are exist as residential for two reasons. They are either grandfathered into our existing code, meaning they existed before the town adopted its existing zoning, or they received a variance or a variance or a special permit approval from the town boards not the town board, but the planning and the zoning board. So I think that's a very important distinction because right now you must have a commercial use on the first floor of your, pro of your building in our Hamlet. So why doesn't the existing zoning work? And so when, when we started looking at zoning and looking at our comprehensive plan policies that are directing us to, to kind of meet the needs of the community where we have infrastructure. And in the Chapelka Hamlet, we have 
public water, public sewer, we have a train station, we have roads, we have lots of infrastructure. So what's wrong with the existing zoning? Even prior to the pandemic, we had vacancies in our commercial spaces. The, 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 the hit on our commercial uses really took hold when online shopping came into play. You know, when Amazon, when you can sit in, you know, as we have seen under the pandemic, everybody's shopping from their computers. Well, that had impacted our brick and mortar establishments long before the pandemic. We also um, have uh, difficulty in under our existing zoning of fitting new commercial uses into our existing zoning. They don't fit within the use categories. Our use categories um, are not up to date, you know, we we still have a use called a silversmith, you know, and, and we have to go through a lot of review to, to associate that with a jewelry store. Um, so the uses are a little bit outdated. We also know and we have learned through this process that it's hard to re reinvest in our existing building stock for today's uses, the use, the service uses, the restaurants, the coffee shops, and the retail uses that people are actually shopping in today. Our building stock is just not um, adequate to accommodate those uses. We have building height limitations, our stories, our, our two to three stories or 35 feet limitations do not accommodate many of today's commercial retailers. They like taller first floors. Um, and if you wanted to do something that was contrary to the existing zoning, you'd have to go through a process with the town's boards to get approval. And that could be a very long and expensive process for somebody, which further takes them away from their end game of making a profit or breaking even on redevelopment of their buildings downtown. Architecture is also an issue in our hamlet. And I don't know how many of you were around when the Bank of America chose to paint their building. We don't have any controls under our existing zoning code to control the color that people paint their buildings. And I'm not saying that we should or should not, but that was something that brought a lot of discussion in town over want our town to look. So with, with these aspects of the code kind of under fire, we know it's not working, it's broken, we need to make amendments. We thought about how to change the code. And you know, the town has, has used many methods of zoning. We have special use permits where you can go to the zoning board or the planning board or the town board and obtain a special permit for the use you wanna put on your property. We have something called overlay districts. Um, the Conifer building downtown is in a workforce housing overlay. That's how they can locate that building on that property. Chapwa Crossings commercial area is under an overlay called the Office Park Retail Overlay District. So it was thought that rather than creating another overlay for the Chappaqua Hamlet, we would look at rezoning to make it clear and concise for people that we are changing our zoning code. So we looked at a form-based code. So a use code, as we have, tells us what type of use you can have in your building on your property. It exists as a rule and regulation the picture to the left shows a bunch of books. That's what our code is today. It's a book. A form-based code focuses on what the building should look like. And it identifies use as a secondary element to its form. It also focuses on how that building relates to the street in front of it and the buildings next door it to it. So it, it's a really holistic approach. It not only includes the regulation, as those of you who have looked at the code that's located in Appendix A of the DGEIS, it does contain regulations that you have to read. It also contains a map, a reg, what we call a regulating plan. There are details, and I'll show you an example of the regulating plan later in this presentation, that really give you more specificity regarding the block or the street that, you're, that your property is located in. It also includes architectural details, okay? I think there, there's over six architectural genres that are referenced in our, in our proposed code that relate to all of the buildings that currently exist in the hamlet and really are mastered off of the Horace Greeley House.
because during the comprehensive planning process, we heard from the community how important the community's history was to them. When we, I showed you the, the map of the zoning districts. This is a map of what's called transects under the form-based code. And many of you have seen these transects. They begin with the F5, the F4. The F5 and F4 are not a height reference. Ultimately, it does relate to five stories, but it's really an F5 zone, which is considered an Hamlet urban center. If you recall, during the comprehensive planning process, the earlier slides, we talked about creating uh, density and then, then pulling back on that density as you move away from the center. This transect idea on this plan reflects that. The transect is the urban center, the existing business area combined with the train station are the center, the F5. The town property going towards Washington Avenue, that could, that's considered part of the urban center, but it's not recommended to place retail in that area. King Street, taking into consideration the hill and the existing challenges connecting upper and lower King Street is considered a general urban area or um, an F4. The business area up on top of the hill by Walgreens where 91 Bedford is being constructed, that's considered a general urban area as well. So the transect idea mirrors the zoning overlay, the, the zoning map that I showed you earlier. They're very similar in their purpose. One of the things that was important to the town as we were deciding on the form-based code was designating a required retail area so we did not affect the existing businesses. So the orange lines on this map show the area where you still need to have commercial retail on the first floor of your buildings. Okay, and that is important to sustain the existing commercial core of our tropical hamlet. All right, so what does all this mean? We, we developed a code, we went through a process, we developed a code, and now we need to um, comply with the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act. And so this review act um, affects 90% of projects that occur in New York State. As legislation, adoption of legislation is not an automatic um, action that you would study to the extent that we're studying it, but it's something that, that the town felt was very important in this instance. So what happens under SECRA is that the lead agency or the town board has to assess the environmental significance of all of the actions that they approve, fund, or directly undertake. In this instance, they are directly undertaking adoption of proposed legislation. So what this means is that the State Environmental, Environmental Quality Review Act requires the lead agency to balance environmental impacts with social and economic factors when deciding to approve or undertake the action. Okay, so that's kind of the overarching definition of why a DGEIS. In seeker terms, our, our form-based code and our DGEIS, our form-based code is considered the proposed action. So this is just a general summary. It's an amendment to our zoning code um, to make our zoning code consistent with our comprehensive plan. It's very important that we have a comprehensive, if we have a comprehensive plan in place, that our zoning does not contradict the policies in that comprehensive plan. It affects 72 acres, and I identify the area along Greeley Avenue and King Street, the zoning districts of business re or retail business, retail business parking, planned industrial and designed business. Why? Again, consistency with our comprehensive plan and to create flexibility for development with the intent to revitalize and create a sustainable and successful mix of commercial and residential uses that also looks to current and future trends and markets. Okay, so again, we don't want to be stuck in a situation where uh, www dot is affecting our commercial businesses. How do you study legislation? Now, th this is kind of, you know, how do you take a book 
and run it against environmental impacts. So in, our, in the world of legislation and DGEIS is one of the tools you use, and I don't know if there's any other tool, but we had to do what's called a build out analysis. We had to understand the maximum amount of development that could ever occur under our proposed code and how that development affects the physical and social infrastructure and environments within our community. Okay, so, so that's the subject of this analysis. In order to really understand, and we couldn't just do a build out on what we were proposing, we had to look at our existing zoning and do a build out on our existing zoning. So we could compare, this is what's happening today under our existing zoning if we were to keep it in place and you know we changed a couple of things. We then look at our form-based code to say, this is our form-based code, how does this look in the future and, and what do we need to do to determine how impact it could be. We had to come up with, with some assumptions. Okay, you couldn't just go with what's there today because we know today we're not seeing any activity in our commercial hamlet. We know that we don't have any house, uh, not a lot of housing in our hamlet to help meet the goals of the comprehensive plan. But we ran, we, we created some assumptions and we applied those assumptions to both the existing code and the proposed code. We had to stay within the realm of what our existing code says with our existing build out, the, the height of two to three stories. We had to use our existing parking requirements. We preserved in both instances, the Horace Greeley house, the Verizon utility building and the post office. We actually kept the park in front of the train station, the AH Memorial Park as it is today under the existing code. And we changed it under the form-based code because that plan calls for enlarging that public space. We also, and probably one of the most important assumptions made in this build out was a parcel consolidation. And I'm gonna to speak to this a little bit because this is a theoretical map that we used in both build outs to join land so that we could apply the codes. Right now in the existing Hamlet, the parcels are small. They're not small enough to take advantage of either today's code or the proposed code. And this is really what's keeping you know, our Hamlet the way it is. And so we assumed under a maximum build out process that parcels would have to be joined to really try and assess the impact. Will this ever happen the way this map shows? Most likely not. It's for theoretical analysis purposes only. When we talk about the draft environmental impact statement, we're looking at 15 areas of study, okay? They run from land use to infrastructure and utilities, socioeconomics, growth inducement, um, and it requires you number 15 to look at alternatives. And those alternatives were selected through the what we called our scoping process, where we created the table of contents for the DGEIS. And as you can see, there's a no build alternative. There's current zoning build out. There's the proposed zoning build out without town property, and there's a, a build out with reduced maximum building height. That discussion of alternatives will occur on October 15th, okay? And we're gonna drill down on each of those alternatives and prepare that and compare them to the proposed action. When we talk about a DGEIS, each section discusses the existing condition today of that topic, its anticipated impact under the maximum build out conditions. So you have a comparison of existing and proposed, and there's a discussion of mitigations for any identified impact under the proposed maximum. I'm gonna switch tax a little bit because we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper on visual resources. This is section 3C of the DGEIS. And tonight I'm not gonna go through every detail of what that DGEIS says, but kind of just give you an overarching um, presentation of what it says. So let's talk about building height. I also wanna use this slide to talk about the regulating plan this is the regulating plan, and there's several different versions of this plan in the proposed code, and that's Appendix A of the DGEIS. You see the F5? 
Okay, that F5 is a transect designation. The height on each of these streets in each of these blocks is found in this rectangular box. So on Lower King Street, King Street, on the side where you have the bookstore and you have the card store, you have two to four. Okay, no building can be less than two or taller than four. Okay, this doesn't say that the existing building on the corner, which is three stories, is a problem. And it doesn't say if there's a one story building on that corner, it's a problem. These are the re recommended height. These details, and, and you can see the orange on this, that's the, the required retail area. These plans, it's called a regulating plan, are, are um, there's one for each area of the study area in the form-based code. Also, I'd like to point out there is a key. At the beginning of this section in the form-based code, there is a key which identifies what these blue squares are. It identifies what this height is. So this is a map. It's like a legend to the map. And the town supervisor is kind of holding that up. That's really important for those of you who want to dig deeper and really understand what this map means. Okay. Going back to the other side of the slide, height. Height was a big discussion for the downtown working group and working with the, um, with the consultant team. And it was really important that we looked at our existing street width, that we took into consideration the King Street Hill, that we recognized the Quaker Street Bridge, that we also recognized the Conifer Building, the existing commercial core. We also know about the high groundwater table in the hamlet and the the desire to not lose any on to not lose any existing parking today. So we need to provide on-site parking. Okay, so those were kind of the background considerations to the um, to the, the height ranges that exist in the proposed code. So one of the first things that we looked at was the difference in the existing code and the proposed code when it came to measuring height. The existing code is two to three stories. The proposed code runs from two to five stories. The existing code measures um, height in feet and it's an average calculation um, based on the midline of the roof line in relation to the average of the ground grade or the finished grade. So it's very convoluted to determine height because you'll say to me, but Sabrina 91 Bedford doesn't look like it's three stories. It looks taller than three stories. Well, you, the measurement isn't by story. It's measured by the height of the roof at a certain point. So we wanted to clarify that in the existing code. So we said, we're going to measure this in stories um, and we're going to use feet. Okay, so, so that's how we looked at building height in the proposed code. The code, Appendix A, also includes diagrams uh, for different scenarios. We, there's a different height for residential on the first floor as opposed to commercial use on the first floor. And any upper level is limited to a height of 11 feet, 11 feet 6 inches. Okay, there are requirements if you have um, living area in your top floor, it counts as a story. There are requirements if you have five stories that you have to set back your fifth story. So there's all sorts of detail, both in written word and in schematic in the proposed code to help the reader understand how to apply it. So when we look at stories, this is the million dollar question everyone wants to know. Um, the purple area is two to four stories. The brown area is two to five stories. And the pink area is two to three stories. There's an area along Washington Avenue that currently exists as town property that is identified as one to four stories. So this map will help you just in a general sense understand stories in relation to the transects. I also want to point out my next slide. Five story property ownership. Okay, the purple is public lands. Most of the five store, all of the five, most of the five story is on town owned lands. The yellow shows the private property ownership, 
where five stories is allowed. And I wanna point out there's about five properties just off the bridge on either side that are allowed according to the regulating plan to go to five stories. The, um, the remaining is all on town property. I think that's important for you to keep in the back of your mind. When we talk about visual resources, under the proposed code, we're looking at proposed architectural design and styling for new structures and spatial open space and landscape requirements to enhance the aesthetic quality of the study area, creating an attractive, cohesive, walkable, commercial mixed use hamlet. The DGEIS examined 11 different locations in relation to the maximum build out. The primary visual impact is the increase in building height, two to three stories to four to five stories in certain locations. There's also as part of the proposed action, a 16 foot build to line, which would accommodate sidewalks and public frontage, okay? This would change the streetscape. In many instances, we will not see this 16 foot build to line come to fruition. If we were to develop in areas and completely redo buildings, those buildings would need to be set back 16 feet from the property line to accommodate that public space. Here is a map, a photo key of all of the visual locations, the 11 areas that were analyzed in the DGEIS. I'm not going to present each one today. There is information in the DGEIS. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. This is a computer generated model of the height analysis of the visual impact of the Hamlet of the proposed code. Um, this model, is a block model. It does not include a lot of architectural detailing and is meant for representation only. I know people have tried to kind of count the lines and say those are stories. You cannot assume that those lines represent stories. It is a visual depiction. So this is a comparison in the DS of South Greeley Avenue looking north toward King Street. The DGEIS presents a picture of what it looks like today and the visual uh, modeling picture with the model, with the generic model that shows it under the form based code. There's also lines on these plans which show the red line. This traces what's there today on the new, on the proposed image. And then it shows that what the blue line what could occur under the zoning today? And this is without any changes uh, to the code. And then you see the height that's under the proposed code. We also did this type of analysis on North Creeley Avenue. So you see what's there today and how it changes in the future under the proposed code. And so not every intersection is documented like this, but there's a lot of discussion about cross sections from certain perspectives in the DGIS. There's a wealth of pictorial information in the visual impact section of the DGIS. I'm gonna move on and talk about traffic, transportation and parking. This is within the DGIS section 3F. Under the DGEIS, there were 10 intersections that were described today and analyzed. The analysis occurred pre-COVID because we know based on the pandemic that traffic and parking patterns have changed. The transportation and parking section of the DGEIS also looks at non-vehicular transportation, bus, train, and bicycle movements. It also looks at non-motorized travel and existing, it looks at existing traffic volumes and conditions, and it does a future no build traffic volume. That's very important to understand. Traffic doesn't stand still. When you do traffic analysis, you have to factor in a gradual increase in traffic like you do population over time. So if you don't do anything, traffic is still going to build. So that no build traffic volume does include traffic increase because that's the way that cars move. It also looks at the future potential traffic impact of the maximum build out. It's also important for you to understand that the traffic analysis included volumes that were um, studied for the conifer building, 
Chappaqua Crossing townhomes and 91 Bedford Road. So, you know, we kind of put in everything that was going on in town and we did the analysis so we would have a real understanding of the traffic condition. So ultimately it was the total projected generated traffic trips plus the no build volumes that equaled the proposed action impacts. And I think it's important to understand if we were to do no building today, there would still be traffic impacts 15, 20 years from now, okay? The question is, what is the difference between those traffic impacts 20 years from now without adopting the proposed code versus what would happen under the proposed code? So we, the key intersections that were analyzed are here. There's 10 of them, they're depicted on the map. You probably all know them and have traveled through them many times. Um, no build volumes, just to give you a definition of that. In, so, so I'm not gonna go through every intersection. The DGEIS visits all 10 intersections and provides existing condition, no build condition and proposed build condition. Um, and gives you status of level of service. I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna talk about in general what the findings were and talk about the, the intersections where there are impacts both under no build and build conditions. Um, in 2019, the existing weekday PM peak hour traffic volumes were grown by a 0.5% per year increase over a 15 year time frame. Okay, that's under no build. That's the that's the 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 rubric that was used to analyze the no build condition. Under the no build condition, all signalized intersections operate at a level of service C. There were minor increases in delays at signalized intersections of 3.4 seconds. There were individual movements, and that's a left turn here, a right turn there, that um, it was determined would be greater than, the delay would be greater than the minor increases. These locations, Woodburn Avenue and South Greeley, where we have a level of service E, the westernmost Quaker Road Triangle intersection, which was level of service F, and the northbound left turn movement from New York State 117 to King Street, which was a level of service C. So when you look at level of service F, when you're talking about traffic, it runs on an A, B, C, D, E, F rating system. F is bad, more delay. A is better, no delay. So there's there's finite measurements within each of those letter categories. So that F in 15 years at that westernmost Quaker Road triangle, that means the town's gonna need to do something whether or not we adopt this code. When we look out build out under the proposed zoning, we base the changes in the study area on a block by block basis. So the blocks that you see in the regulating plan, we looked at the development by those blocks. And we there are tables in the DGIS, table 3F5, that shows you those block by block analyses. Again, Minor increases and an overall delay of now 10.6 seconds or less would be seen at the signalized intersections with an overall level of service C or better at the intersections. And again, the individual movements like the, the westernmost length of the Quaker Street Triangle increased delay. So that F got even worse. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the comparison of the four areas that, or the three areas that were identified as needing what we call mitigation. So as I said before in my, in my introduction, each section of the DGEIS talks about the existing condition, what happens or the impacts that come about under the proposed conditions and recommendations on how to mitigate those impacts. At South Greeley and Woodburn, at getting into the train station from South Greeley Avenue, under no build, the delays going in an eastbound direction, follow the arrows on the picture, increases by 11.2 seconds. It changes from a level of service D under a no build condition to a level of service E. 
Okay, that's that's kind of today it's at D, it moves to E 15 years from now. Under the proposed under the proposed legislation, significant delays, 210.6 seconds, are seen on the eastbound Woodburn approach with level of service degrading from the E 15 years from now to level of service F. Okay, so that kind of encapsulates the before and after condition of that intersection. We look at the one of the other areas is the Quaker Road and South Greeley intersection, and you can see the arrows on the map. Under the no build condition, the westernmost triangle intersection um, sees delays, that's the red arrow in the picture, increasing by 31.2 seconds, changing it from an E to an F under no build conditions. So that's the way it is today. If we do nothing, it will be an F in 15 years. And depending on traffic patterns, it could be sooner than 15 years. Under the proposed zoning code, the delays increase by 72.2 seconds, okay? It worsens the no build condition of E, okay? That leg where the red arrow is doesn't go outside of the E category. Instead, the Northern Triangle intersection where you see the gold arrow, that sees delays of 60.9 seconds. It goes from a level of service C under the no build condition to a level of service F under the build condition. When you look at King Street and North Bedford Road, under the, under the no build condition, the northbound left turn movement increases by 10.4 seconds, which changes the level of service from a B today to a level of service C in 15 years or tomorrow. If the code was to be implemented, the northbound left turn movement going past the proposed new firehouse towards Langs Deli will increase by 39.8 seconds, changing it from a level of service C today to a level of service E under the proposed build condition. Okay, so we have some traffic impacts. It's clear and everybody understands traffic impacts because we all drive our cars. What are you gonna do about it? So the DGEIS talks about mitigations that are typically used in situations like we are facing. And you're all very familiar with the new lights that have been implemented in town. We have one at King, uh, King Street and the Avenue, that traffic light that went in. And there's a traffic light up across from the high school in relation to traffic crossing. Well, under in, in 15 years, whether we build or not, we're looking at a traffic signal at the South Greeley intersection with Woodburn Avenue. We're also looking at modification of the triangle to a traditional T or a modified roundabout. And for those of you that have been around for a while, we did look at a modified roundabout um, with a downtown streetscape and infrastructure improvement project. We could not obtain state approval for that project. But again, we're tracking on those same lines where we're going to need to make modifications. We also, it was recommended that we install a full southbound right turn lane on the southbound New York State 117 approach to King Street as you come on down into the hamlet at the North Bedford Road uh, King Street intersection. Okay, it's a mouthful. But so, so I just want to say that the DGEIX, DGEIS talks about the mitigations and it also recommends timing. It, it says that most likely these improvements as they're recommending here under the build condition will not be necessary until future development uh, in the train station parking lots occurs. Okay, so that's kind of what the DGEIS says. The DGEIS also talks about other mitigations. As I said before, when, when I started talking about transportation and parking um, and traffic, there are other areas studied other than the movement of cars. There's also recommendations regarding the addition of sidewalks in these five locations. Um, and that's to help with pedestrian movement in the hamlet. 
And as I said before, the mitigation phasing, it says Woodburn and Greeley and triangle improvements can so it coincide with town owned land and the King Street and North Bedford Road improvements can co coincide with any development that occurs up in that upper upper King Street area. When it comes to parking, it's important to note that the proposed code re-examine parking requirements and actually reduces our parking requirements from our code today based on ITE standards. Those standards are update, updated regularly. And from the last time that we put our parking standards in place under our existing code, new patterns and trends have, have emerged and we have aligned our requirements to be more consistent with those standards. We also, as part of the form-based code in the regulation itself have created a parking toolbox. And this enables flexibility to satisfy parking requirements due to the proximity of the train station to much of this area. So I think that that's important to know. That's kind of wrapping up tra transportation and parking. We're going to talk about next steps. I'm going to reiterate this again. Um, next week, Thursday, October 15th, we have a presentation on the alternatives that are found within the DGEIS. On October 20th is the opening of the public hearing on the DGEIS and the proposed legislation. The town board will be accepting and re will be reviewing, accepting, and um, um, reviewing and accepting the final generic environmental impact statement. They'll be making an environmental determination and creating findings. And then they'll be considering amendment to amendment and or adoption of the form based code. Questions and comments can be sent to Chappaqua Forward at mynewcastle.org. I know there's been a lot of questions about the public hearing. Comments will be able to be submitted by email if you don't want to appear and speak at the public hearing virtually, you can submit an email. You can submit an email to chapelcoforward at mynewcastle.org or public comments at mynewcastle.org. And now I'm sure we have a lot of hands raised. I'm going to open it up to questions and discussion. Great. Thanks, Sabrina. So just to remind everybody, if you would like the opportunity to ask Sabrina a question, please raise your digital hand. Um, I also just want to mention, Sabrina talked about the um, upcoming public hearing. Um, please remember that this call today is really um, hopefully to give you the information that you need in order to prepare your um, comments and submissions for the public hearing. So when you submit comments um, at the public hearing, our consultants are required to provide a written response to those comments and questions. Today is really about sort of fact finding and making sure you have all the information that you need in order to be able to do that. So um, I just wanna make that distinction that, that this, these comments and questions don't become a part of the public record in the same way that um, the, the comments and questions that you're gonna ask during the public hearing do. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start to invite people into the call. Um, and the first person who has their hand raised and has been patiently waiting for the past 56 minutes uh, is Roger Klepper. Just need to unmute yourself. There, am I, am I unmuted now? You're on. All right. Roger. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, appreciate all the work here. Um, hopefully this meets the confines of what we're supposed to be doing at, at this stage of the process. But um, just a, a comment on the, on the project in general. I was you know, back, I guess you, you had mentioned 2012, 2013. Um, you know, I, I participated in those those focus groups and those sessions, and you know, and I think a lot of the comments about this project, people have said, you know, wait, we didn't we didn't say back then that we we wanted all these buildings downtown. Yeah, I mean that may have been the case, but you know, the format of that, as I think we all know, I mean, those were focus groups, and you know, in those focus groups, the, the what we were asked is, what do you want? How do you want to live? And what are what do you want in your town? And I think. A big thing was was housing diversity, um, and so I think you know when people see the, see these buildings downtown, if we start from the premise of you know we want housing diversity in our community, um, you know it's kind of a different question. You know where where does it make best sense for that that housing to be located, and um, you know I think 
if you look at it in those terms, I think the Hamlet is 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 ultimately the right answer. Um, so I think you know I think it's it's you know I think there's a lot of lot of good in this. With that with that being said, um, you know I think there's a lot here, but you know and I think there's been somewhat of a myopic focus on the maximum build out, which you know I think um, and I think and also now the traffic that was you know a lot of very good information there. Um, now, I mean, I think, and I think some of the things that have been said is, you know, that's the maximum build out. We have to show it, you know, that may not be all that likely and it, it, and you know, that's, those things are going to take some time. Um, you know, I'll make a couple of comments there, um, to that. And, and one, you know, even if it takes 15 years, 20 years to get to that maximum build out, you know, if we think that that's possible, you know, I don't think it really matters. I think we have to that's what we have to look at, you know, whether it's a year from now, which it certainly won't be a year from now or, or whatever the time horizon is. Um, and I think the other thing that gets mentioned is, um, is the land and, and the fact that a town owns the land and, you know, we don't have to sell the land if we don't want to. Um, you know, I mean, I think we already know that that's something the town wants to consider, you know, is selling the land, particularly the train station, um, the train station parking lot. So I, I, I think, you know, if we're developing a code, we have to develop a code with our eyes wide open, you know, that contemplates and that can handle all of the things that we're actually currently considering, which is selling the land. I mean, wouldn't it be terrible if all of a sudden we, 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 we wrote the code and we thought it was a great idea to sell the land in the train station parking lot. We look at it and say, gee, too bad the code really, you know, isn't, isn't consistent with this. So, you know, I think, you know, in the absence of anything else to look at, which I don't really see anything compelling to look at, I think we have to look at the maximum build out and get everyone on the same page and say, okay, let's assume this is, this is what it's going to look like from traffic to everything. And then we can, we can decide based on that. And then we've got something that we can move forward with and be prepared for, to allow once the once the um, the ink is dried on the form based code, developers are going to do what developers do, and we have to be prepared for for what our town is going to look like, you know, when that all transpires. Well, Roger, I, I would like to say, uh, you know, I appreciate your comments. Um, and, and I'm going to say that the, the DGEIS, the Draft Generic Environmental Impact Statement, does look at the maximum build out. I mean, that's what it is intended to do. Right. I mean, I, I, but I think, and I, I, I hear that, but I think at times I've heard people say, well, you know, we don't have to sell them. I feel like there's been in some ways an attempt to encourage people not to necessarily completely look at that as, as the expectation, you know, the, the option to not sell the land. I mean, a lot of emphasis has been put on that and, and also the, the timing and that there's no certainty um, that it's, it's a very conservative look. But, you know, I think, you know, we are the risk takers in this equation. And when you're, when you, as the town, when you are the risk taker, you have to be conservative in your assumptions. So I mean, whatever it is, if we decide that we want five stories downtown, I think we have to do it on the basis of something that we see that assumes there's gonna be that maximum build out that we sell the land and it looks as, as and it looks how it's being presented. And, and I'm just going to, and, and yes, you are 100% correct. And the, the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act requires us to do just that, which is what this document does. I cannot speak to the chatter that is occurring out in the community about we don't want to ever sell the land, we want to sell the land. That's not part of this equation. We have created a code which includes town property and the this, the analysis that is conducted through the draft impact statement identifies the impacts, including the development that is proposed on town land. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's great. I just want, I mean, 
it's just my position. We should assume the max build out and, and whatever that is, then, then, then all of the discussions can be, can be based on that, which I think then, I think to, to a certain extent, as a result of that, I think some of the discussions can be much more constructive. Roger, I appreciate your comment. Sure. The, uh, the next person we have with a hand raised is Lynn Lambert. Hi, thank you for, uh, Sabrina, for, for spelling it out very well. You do a, a good job of that and it's not easy, I know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, have to, I have questions really about the process which underlies the whole thing. So if you don't mind, um, I, I truly don't understand why this plan is being presented when, as Sabrina says, it's not complete on either content or substance. Examples that are very troubling to me are, despite the, the fact that the study says one of the areas that they were studying was community services, but neither the fire department or CVAC were interviewed about their ability to or the costs involved in supplying services to the far larger population proposed here. Um, the other thing, uh, obviously among many, but of course lots of people are bringing up that um, there were actually not some numbers put forward about how many students would be added to the school system without getting any input from CCSD, but there are numbers provided that seem entirely inaccurate to just anybody with a brain. So I, I want to know what is the timeline for completing this process or that you guys anticipate after October 20th, which is the last specific thing you have listed. And I hope that what will happen is that uh, it feels very premature and half-baked right now in some areas like the ones I've just brought out. Other things seem very detailed, got it. Um, but my concern is it feels like it's it's being pushed forward in a, in, a, in a very rapid way. And I'm hoping that we'll have a chance to get all this other information that is lacking and to correct some errors and definitely the omissions I mentioned and others um, before, and, and it be brought back to the community for us to fully wrap our arms around this without those uh, incomplete parts and then get our comments. So like what I'm feeling is that the process is a little odd. You know, how can you look at Chappaqua and adding so many new people and not look at the impact on the schools? How can you not ask the fire department what that means? And just so you know, some of us just citizens are going out to ask some questions on our own. And what we heard from uh, Eric Nicolasian, uh, from who's the chair of the Board of Fire Com Commissioners for Newcastle Fire Department number one, was that it seemed likely that they would have to either go to a part paid or a fully paid uh, fi firefighters. That's expensive. And then they, they would have to first get past the addition that they're trying to make and then go to the added expense, which they were not planning to do, of building out the second floor of that addition so they'd have room for these paid firefighters to bunk. All of this would add greatly to our, our fire taxes. And it would only be, by the way, for, for this side of town um, where the development is happening. So there are so many open issues like this uh, that um, I, I'm just hoping that you can give me some reassurance and some of the rest of us that this as it is will just kind of be paused or put on hold while much more information gets filled in and that we can have a chance to com comment on it at that time when it's much more complete. Thank you very much. Sabrina, do you wanna comment on the, the process and where we are right now? I think it's just helpful for people to understand that we are at the point of the draft generic environmental impact statement. And so this draft, um, it, it was our preference to share this with the community and to include the community as often and as thoroughly as we can. So, and we gave this to um, our interested parties simultaneously. Um, and 
now we will go and we will meet with those parties and we will accept their, their comments at the same time that we're accepting yours. So, you know, that's, that's if we've erred in that way, just understand that we are still at the draft point in this um, and we are still accepting comments and feedback. And it, you're exactly right that it's important information for us to be able to collect and we look forward to the the conversations with CVAC and the fire department. Sabrina, you look like you're about to jump well, in. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%, Ivy, but I also think it's important for the community to understand that we did communicate with the school district. We did communicate with the emergency services in, in preparing the draft code. Um, you, you know, uh, the, the, the pro we're at a different stage in the process right now. Um, from day one, those entities have been what's called interested agencies in, in secret, which means they get copies of every touch point that we are required to under the law to, to publish and, and kind of distribute. Um, but there were a lot of conversations with emergency services and communications with the school district um, administration and you know the, the folks like myself and the other professionals at town hall to really try and include the information. You know, I think it's also for people to important for people to understand understand that the market scan that was conducted that's found, I think it's in Appendix F of the DGEIS, speaks to the market of what's going on today in relation to housing um, in proximity to train stations, that they are one and two bedroom rental units, um, not three and four bedroom homes. Um, and I think that that's important because the proposed code is based off of the analyses that were done to formulate that code. And the DGEIS is in response to that analysis. I'm gonna give you an example of what happens between now and the FEIS. I've heard comments about, well, what if there were more three bedrooms? That would be a much greater impact on the school district. And it may be, I do not know, but that comment in and of itself is considered a substantive comment that will be required to be addressed in the FEIS. So, so as we go through this process, I'm hopeful that all substantive questions um, will be submitted to the town and we will answer them. We will get the information that's necessary to put the community you know, at rest regarding these issues. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just... I have to say, I spoke to these people. I spoke to the fire commissioner. I, and I asked him if his fire chief had also had, had been asked. And I, I emailed with, with CVAC. And Warren Messner said at the last meeting, and if you listen to the school board meeting, they are all saying, they are all saying the same thing. They got a document. They got it. And, and Lynn, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, but just to, that, to that they, point, they, they have the document at the they, same they, time they, that, they, that the public they, got the document. And we are it. now holding a follow up conversation with the school district in order to get their feedback on the analysis that was done and whether the right set of numbers were used and to, to run very, various analyses if we need to based on the feedback that we get from them. So very much still an open and ongoing conversation at this draft phase. Okay. Um, the next person with their hand raised is Ed Frank. Ed, just unmute yourself. Ed, you're in, you just need to unmute your microphone. I'm not sure if he's hearing us. Do you want me to go on to the and next we person? We can't yeah. hear you. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You oh, there it. we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. And good afternoon to all. So um, I, I have some comments, which I'll break into two separate parts. The first one is the parking lot. Um, as, as you may know, uh, the Conifer building is constructed 
in a high groundwater table area. It's constructed on piles as a result. And so the parking is on grade. Uh, the parking lot is actually at a uh, lower elevation with a high groundwater table. Any buildings constructed there would also have to be constructed on piles so that the parking cannot, will have to be at grade level. And if it's going to be a five-story building, you might need two levels of parking, either under the building or a separate parking structure next to it. So I, I don't know if that was taken into account. And also on, uh, I don't know if you know this, but South Greeley Avenue, buildings constructed there, uh, like the Bank of America, for example, or where the hardware store is, they're constructed on piles. So parking cannot be underneath, which raises the question to me, if there are four levels of apartments above retail, uh, how, how, where do these people park? How do you provide the proper number of um, parking spaces in accordance with the town of Newcastle code? Um, in reference to, um, Greeley, uh, so that takes care of uh, the parking lot and Greeley Avenue. Um, now, I, I have some other comments. Um, I've read some things that indicate that uh, we should be concerned about being left behind when compared to Mount Kisco, which has the proposal for a large building right at the train station, and what is going on in uh, adjacent towns like Pleasantville. In my personal opinion, Chappaqua is simply not comparable to either of those villages. Uh, Mount Kisco has the Northern Westchester Hospital Center and a number of large nearby medical centers on Route 172. There are several auto dealerships, Target, TJ Maxx, Home Goods, Party City, a movie theater, the Grand Prix Rec Center, a, a, a diner, the Holiday Inn, and many restaurants. So there's reasons Ed, why- Ed, I've been to Mount Kisco. Are you, are you getting close to a question on this? Yeah, I am. <laughs> so what I'm saying is I don't see the comparison uh, between the two. In reference to Pleasantville, there's a drawer there and they have the Burns Theater, two auto dealers, many restaurants, a diner, and uh, in fact, the two new buildings that were constructed near the Burns Theater on Washington Avenue are only three stories. So it, it seems to me that um, a five-story building on Greeley Avenue, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. I would think that if there were four or five-story tall buildings to be built in Chappaqua, they would be built at the Chappaqua Crossing, keeping in mind that the Reader's Digest Cupola building when viewed from the front is three stories. I, I, and um, I really think, uh, and other people think, that this matter should be put on hold for now and wait for a time when public meetings can be held in person to further to further discuss this matter. And uh, I know um, Lynn Lambert brought up the issue of the fire department. I have to be a fire commissioner. And I could tell you that the current fire apparatus that we have, meaning fire trucks, uh, do, do not have a ladder tall enough to uh, deal with a five-story building. And um, so then uh, there's no question that we need the three bay expansion of the firehouse, which, by the way, will be coming up for a vote sometime in the Ed, next- Ed, I, Ed I've, got, I've got only a few, I've got nine people with their hands raised and I, I, I wanna let you speak, but I, I'm gonna need to ask to, to get to the, the question. Um, okay, so, so my, my question would be, why are, based upon what I've said, why are you considering buildings as tall as five stories, especially on South Greeley Avenue. 
Okay, so the first part of the question, Sabrina, can you address the issues with regard to the water table and parking? Yeah, so so that was all considered as part of, so, so there was a, a policy decision that was made by the town board that there would be no net loss in parking in existing municipal parking. So so that was put out there. The other consideration, you know, I did the slide regarding building height. The other consideration was the high groundwater and the realization that we could not go underneath buildings um, underground. Um, so those considerations were factored into the determination of height. Okay. And thank okay, you for comments. We do look forward to seeing the feedback and the, the comments, hopefully during the public hearing that we'll receive from the, the fire department. Um, like I said before, it's really critical for us to, to know all of those things and to get that feedback. So I'm glad you're here and I do look forward to receiving that. Thank you. The next person who has their hand raised is uh, Marianne O'Connor. Hi, Marianne. Hi. Um, can everyone hear me? We can. Okay. Um, thanks for having the hearing and um, uh, Sabrina, thank you for your very clear, you might have been a teacher at one point in your life because it's, everything is uh, very clear. Um, I, I have a question, a couple of questions about process. Um, and my, my understanding from everything I've read is that this board is choosing not to have a public rent referendum before rezoning of town-owned land. Is that correct? You're before not, rezoning yeah. of town-owned land. No, that, let's be very clear. You have a right to a public referendum if we sell the property. No, no I'm talking about, Jeremy, no. I'm talking about rezoning. My question is not, we're not on sale or lease yet. I'm on rezoning. Will this town board have a public referendum before you rezone town owned land. I'm sorry, yes. Jen Gray from, from oh. Keenan being our town attorneys will address that issue. Hi, how are you? This is Jennifer Gray. Um, so there is, this is a, a local law to amend zoning, just like the town board has adopted many local laws to amend zoning over the years, over the decades. Yes, um, I, no, I, I know no what that I know for the town board to have a referendum on a local law amending zoning. So okay, so I guess I look at I guess I look at what the Newcastle Democrats ran on, and Jeremy, at your last meeting, you said um, this is what uh, this is what we you know this was a platform piece for us, and I look at what you ran on in your website, and I quote: "The town can rezone the current parking lots to enable future developments should the community choose to pursue this path pursuant to a public referendum." So your statement that you would rezone to enable development, you would only do it with a with a public it's referendum. Not my statement. I know it's not my statement. I'm very sure. It's, it's, not it's not my statement. No matter how many times you say it, no matter how you want to twist it, very simply, there's not going to be a public referendum to have it make this decision. Ultimately, if it is sold, then you would have a right to to follow through with a public referendum. And if okay, so then let's talk like, about selling or leasing. If you're not if you're not going to go with what you said on your campaign website, well, I'm just asking no, about no. process. Can we no, can we get a commitment today from each of the five town board members that if you do want to pursue selling or leasing town old land? that you will submit the matter to a referendum on the board's own motion without waiting for the public to petition to seek a referendum. Ivy, you just said like two minutes ago, we want to include the community as thoroughly as we can. And I think that would show the town and this community that you're involving the town and not requiring us to petition for a referendum if you wanna sell the town owned land. So Can that's we, fair. I've been saying that all year, um, and that is certainly a commitment I'm willing to make. Um, but I think that that's a matter that the town board should discuss with our town attorney. So I will have to take that under advisement. I'm not going to ask people to make any commitments today until they've had the opportunity to speak to the attorneys. Okay, so we we would like to know from the five of you what your position is on we, that. I think this we got is it. very important. So if you could at the next meeting, maybe between now and the next meeting, if you can consult with your attorney or maybe by the October 20th meeting, this is a very important uh, point for the town. 
I guess the other question I have is for Lisa and Lauren. I haven't heard a single word from you at any of these sessions. What is your position? If you had to vote on this today, as it is drafted, would you vote yes? Or do you have any reservations on any points that sorry, you would consider I, further? I, I just wanna, I, I wanna stop you there president. because we're not at a point where the town board is ready to make commitments about how we're going to vote on something. We have a draft generic environmental okay, impact but I, statement. But we haven't it's heard not, anything. I'm sorry, can I, can I finish Jordan. please? I'm sorry, can I finish please? The town board has a draft generic environmental impact statement. We are considering carefully all of the feedback that we are getting from the community and we know that we need to make changes to what's in front of us today. We're not at a place where we're willing to make commitments as to how we're going to vote on that. That's just not where we are in the process. So I wanna thank you for coming and thank you for your comments, but we're gonna move forward. Ivy, can I comment on that for two seconds though? And I'd like to you know, comment as well. Go ahead, please. You know, I, I just wanna say that you should not uh, think that lack of speaking at this public hearing here means that there's a lack of consideration. Sometimes there's a time to listen and sometimes there's a time to speak. And this is a time when I'd like to listen to what all of you have to say. That does not mean that we are not considering everything and that I don't have significant ideas about the form-based code as I'm sure every town board member has. And we have a lot of discussions we still need to have and a lot of input we still wanna hear Great. from you. So just because I'm not speaking up does not mean I'm not listening and taking every single thing you and every other resident is both speaking and writing to us into account. And I'd also like to just um, replicate what Lisa has just said because at, I think at this point in the process, we do, we need to listen to you folks. I read all the Facebook comments. I know I don't comment as much. I don't engage on Facebook as much as um, the other town board members. But for, for my purposes, it's important to, for me to listen to what you guys have to say and to hear you out. So I'm, I'm utilizing the point of the process and hearing you all out on these engagement sessions and we will hear you at the public hearing. Thanks guys, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> so the next person with their hand raised is uh, Douglas Pedrella. Please just unmute yourself. You should be I open. Mr. Pedrello, we're having trouble hearing you. No. No. <laughs> Still not getting anything on this side. His line is open. Mr. Pedrella, if you are having trouble, you can always type your question into the chat box. Okay, I'm sorry. We're gonna we're gonna move on. Okay. If you can you hear me? Oh, now we can hear you. <laughs> sorry, uh, I was confused. It's Timothy Burke. Um, I wanted to respond to one thing before I get to my question. Uh, the increased tax base will allow fire safety in schools to better expand and at more economies of scale. So I believe this is going to be less expensive, not more expensive for residents. Um, my question was, uh, I think this is a good looking plan. I'm just wondering if you think this is going to include enough housing to meet the increased demand in, uh, in our town. In the, the mark, uh, I would, sorry, go ahead, Sabrina. Yeah, I, so it's, it's, our population 
forever now has grown by the zero point percent. We haven't had a tremendous population change. I think that when we talk about demand, we have a demand today for the type of housing that the form-based code is proposing. Does it encapsulate all of the demand that's out there? I, I, I probably not, um, but it, it is, as you can see, the amount of development that we think is consistent with the tenants that set, are set forth in the comprehensive plan and the DGEIS is really outlining whether or not our infrastructure, both physical and social, can handle it. Um, so, you know, I can tell you, you know, in our, in our analysis of our water system, we have plenty of capacity in our water we have more housing in relation to our water system? Most likely, yes. But as you can see with traffic, we have to make certain traffic improvements, you know, you know, in 15 years, both with and without the proposed zoning. And I think it's really the amount of development that is contemplated is consistent with what the community has asked for through the comprehensive plan and the discussions um, prior to developing the code. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Uh, the next person we have is Michelle Gregson. Can you hear me? We can. Hi, Michelle. Hi, everybody. I'm not going to be nearly as contentious as everybody else because I've worked with all of you and I want to thank you for all you do for our town and especially during this very difficult time. Um, having lived here for over 20 years, I think um, I'll speak for myself, but I know some others who feel as I do. Um, we're a little gun shy only because we've seen Chappaqua Crossing go this way and that way. Um, whether the town should approach that property has always been up for discussion. We've seen seven bridges be built based on projections of growth, only to find out later that maybe it shouldn't have been built at all. And, and our taxes went way up because of that. I mean, you all know you're shaking your heads. And uh, and now we have this low income housing that a prior board that none of you had anything to do with. And we fought terribly to not have it in that location is there. So I think people are a little gun shy. I personally think the town looks very depressing and we need to do something. And I And I totally agree when you presented the fact that, you know, when the bank made it like orange, no one could believe it. And my question was, why didn't the board do something, but you couldn't? So there you have it. Um, I think what most of us are feeling is we'd like to see a little more meat on the bone before we attack all of you, at least I feel that way, because it, this is just really a skeleton of what this could be. And people were fighting all the work that you'd been doing up to this point in town. And now everyone's, wow, it looks so great, you know, Everyone forgets the three years of disruption. And I guess I hope that there's some forethought given to, again, disrupting everyone downtown um, and, and making this something that we can all be very proud of um, in the way it looks and our ability to control what happens and not let it just go amok. That, that's my only comment. Um, and I'm sure you would agree, you don't wanna have everyone doing their own thing. Thank you, Michelle. I want to jump in and just say, for, again, thank you very much. But it's critical to understand it is not a construction plan. It is not right. a developmental plan. It is not putting um, you know, shovels in the ground for ground-ready construction. That is not what this is. We are not designing buildings in terms of what's going to be, even though you see that, that blow up in that uh, uh, the bat max build out. That's, that's because we have to do that. But we are, we are, that's not our role. That's not our job. Um, so people should not construe this as another long haul of, of construction because that's, that's not what this is. But I do understand the concern and, and use the term gun shy. Thanks, Jeremy. The next person with their hand raised is Arlie Bennett. Hi, thanks for having me again. I really appreciate the work that you guys have put into this so far. I know that I might be a thorn in your behind, but regardless, I'll uh, continue. So 
you might do you guys find it frustrating before covid when you would get off the train station and walk down the stairs and then go to your car the amount of traffic that would occur with everyone trying to leave the station at one time my response to that is i think there potentially should be a light there to make it a better a better flow of traffic so okay. the answer is yes and sure. if understood so if we were to increase the capacity because you guys said you're not going to sacrifice parking so to that point what would happen if you guys increased the parking capacity two times or three times that means that it would take people like 20 minutes 30 minutes possibly even 40 minutes to get home traveling only three to five miles um let me see next point after Spending a day in Manhattan, say when I'm going to work, pre-COVID, post-COVID, what have you, and I get off the train and say it's summertime and the light, the light is still out, the sun is still shining, and I enjoy that beautiful panoramic view of the tree line sitting behind the retail fronts of uh, South Greeley and all of those houses up there. By your proposal, I know it's not a construction proposal, but the rendering that I saw today, which was very dramatic, showed a potential, obviously it's potential, not a construction plan, of a two to four story building. So I would basically be walking from one cavernous city and then going downstairs from the train to the parking lot and that tree line would be gone. It would be behind the structure of the buildings in the proposal of a possible uh, area in the second tier of the parking area would be just built up. So that whole visible uh, attraction of getting off the train and feeling a relief of not being boxed in and claustrophobic like you can possibly feel while you're in the city, that would be gone. Um, lastly, last note, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, traffic has increased consistently over the years since I lived in town. And I'm really finding it super difficult to understand how on earth this plan would at all decrease that. In fact, it would increase it. People trying to focus on uh, possibly not having a car. They're saying, oh, I'll live in the hamlet of Chappaqua. There's a train station right there. Where would they go for a for groceries, should they Uber, should they Lyft, should they take a cab or just get it delivered? Um, it, it's very concerning. Um, I could go more into it, but you guys have more people waiting, but I uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for your comments, we appreciate them. The next person who has their hand raised, Larry Rose. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? Hi Larry, we can hear you. Great, great. Um, uh, Sabrina, you did another great job in presenting the uh, info. And uh, I think you kind of need to see the plan multiple times to really understand the plan. And I do real estate development, so uh, I, I can only imagine how overwhelming it is for people that don't do this for a living. Um, I have a couple of specific questions. Um, the first one is uh, in no particular order of importance. Um, Sabrina, you did, you did a great job in talking about traffic and going over things. So the things that you didn't really touch on, to me, like stand out glaringly. Uh, the biggest one today was parking. Um, and my question is, because you were very clear saying there will be no net loss to municipal parking. But what I didn't hear or see or touch upon in your presentation was, is there any parking going to be provided on the property owner on the private property? Meaning, last time we had discussed, we're we're looking at you know upward of a million square feet of residential potentially being built in this form-based code if it's maxed out. How much parking is being required on the private property? Like, what is that zoning? And I know you said it was changing. Like, you kind of mentioned things. That if you didn't know what you were saying, you wouldn't. It would you. You wouldn't even think twice about it, which is part of the reason why I'm mentioning it. Uh, so that that's one point um, that I just would like some clarification on. Um, 
when you talk about it not being a construction project, and this is as much for you as for everyone else listening, it's, you're right, but what's happening here is we're gonna come up with a plan that once, if this gets approved, let's say it gets approved as is, a developer, myself, someone else comes in, they now have the right to build, let's call it four or five stories. Let's find out what the parking is. There's no environmental study that needs to happen because that's what this is. So all you're really doing at that point is, you're, as long as you're within the height and the density, you're good to go and you get a, a say in color, materials and all that. Um, so which leads me to the next question. When you talk about process and we're in a draft phase, and I've been through this process many times, typically you don't get to the point of a public hearing until the public's really had a lot of time to view it, touch it, see it. And I feel like while this, while this process might have gone on for multiple years, in terms of what's happening now, when I looked at your first slide, it was literally within a month. It was September 29th, October 8th, October 15th, and then five days later, we're having a meeting to have a public hearing on this. So, and the way this process works is, once you get past the DEIS, whatever changes are gonna be made are made in the FEIS. Once you're past that, the finding statement is, it's more obligatory than anything else. Nothing major is gonna happen then. So I guess my question is, how do you, what would you guys need to see? Cause there's only 40 people on this call. What would you guys need to see that would be impressive enough to you to revise what you've got in front of you? Um, and I say that only because when I look back at the last election, um, and I voted for a bunch of you guys. I must have gotten the amount of mailings and communication I got from literally the people I'm looking at right now versus the amount of communication I got on this issue that I, if I didn't stumble upon it on Facebook, I never would have known, you know? And I, I feel like there's a disconnect between wanting more people to be involved and you guys literally personally making that happen in a way, because this touches a lot of people, like I can only imagine the people that don't know about this are gonna wake up after you vote and be like, what the hell happened? Like, and you know, I, I just feel like, uh, and, I, and keep in mind, I'm speaking as someone who generally likes the plan. So this is not, I'm not, you know, an anti-development person here. I'm just saying, you know, I think that the speed in which you are going from three, you know, what I'll call them information sessions to a public hearing seems awfully quick. So with that, if Sabrina could give us any color on the parking, that would be helpful. I'll give you some color on the parking. Um, the parking code today was revised to less parking based on updated ITE standards. So it's one point something. It's not one, but it's more than one per unit. Um, and the requirement is that if you are developing on private property, you must provide parking for your property, for what you are developing. There is a parking toolbox, which gives you options to accommodate some of that parking. That is what's new in this code as opposed to the existing parking sections of the code. Thanks. So I'm I'm just gonna do a time check for everybody. We're um, at little we're at a um, hundred minutes right now, a little over the hour and a half that we were set for. Um, we actually we have a hard stop tonight at six o'clock. Unfortunately, um, Sabrina and I have to get home and feed kids and make them do their homework and all those other good things that you guys probably have to do too. We have four people with their hands raised right now. We're gonna take um, Maggie Ferguson, Suzanne Chazen, uh, the nine one four number that ends in uh, seven eight two eight. Uh, and Joanna Coogan, uh, and then we're gonna um, call it a night after that uh, and, and hopefully pick up with everybody um, at our next session. So uh, the, the next person who we have is uh, Margaret Ferguson. Hello, can you hear me? We can, you're on. Okay, uh, does the DGEIS provide an analysis of what will happen to all the cars that are displaced from municipal lots? in a full build out. 
the DGEIS assumes that there will be no loss of municipal parking in the train station for all the cars that currently park there today. So that is a policy decision that was made by the town board and under the full build out, all this will need to be maintained. Whether they are maintained in their current form is yet to be determined. Okay, so it does not contain an analysis of what happens to the big ugly, meaning the 1500 plus cars that are daily in the municipal lots. That's during a full build out. It does not currently contain that, correct? about how they're going to be reshaped to accommodate. There's assumptions that are built into the build out analysis that there will be parking structures. I understand that there's an assumption that they will not be lost, but it doesn't explain anything in detail about where they will go. Is that right? No. Correct. Do we have a total figure on the number of cars, and, you know, an average estimate on the number of cars that daily are in all the municipal lots that will be uh, built over in a full, full build out. Do we know how many cars we're talking about? I, I think it depends on what happens on town land. Well, I'm saying in a full build out, we're in assuming- a full build out, That build out is currently proposed at five stories to accommodate at least one level of parking to accommodate the existing parking that will be displaced due to the placement of the building. But I'm saying right now, do we have a figure, an estimate of how many cars are daily average of cars in all the municipal lots during a weekday? Do we know how many cars are there today? An average, yeah. Yeah, we have those numbers. Jill, do you know what those numbers are? I don't know them offhand. I want to say 1,100. 1,100. How many spaces are there in the commuter lot? Approximately 1,100. 1,100? Okay. That's, and that, when I say that includes the daily, that includes that, the, That's what I was about to say. Does that, in, does that include the. There's only 99 of those spots. That's, that's yeah, all the, the that's front lot and the back lot. Okay. Yes. Has the town board done a fiscal analysis of what the cost would be, since you're saying there's an assumption there's gonna be a garage, the fiscal analysis of any version of a garage, uh, how much it would cost per space, how much it would cost for a certain number of cars? Has the town board done that? No. No. Um, then I assume the town board also has not done an analysis of how that garage would be paid for or who would pay for it. I assume that if you've done no analysis, no. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Debrina, to be clear, nonetheless, the, the, to build it out, we would have to have the parking, correct? Yes. So that it's not getting built out unless there's a, a, a means to address the parking, correct? Correct. So if the the developer who used that term is not going to contribute or be a part of that, and the town isn't going to be contribute to be a part of that, and we can't accommodate those spaces, then if I'm understanding it correctly, that particular project doesn't get built. Correct. Thank you. The next person with their hand raised, Suzanne Chazen. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I know you're, you're pressed for time, so I'll keep this short. One of my big concerns right now is, Sabrina, you went through the process after this point about the final environmental impact and, the, you know, obviously the public hearing and all. Um, one of my concerns is that it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that basically we're having this engagement with you right now, but it kind of all doesn't really go on the record. Then with the public hearing, we get to say our piece then you guys go back or basically you go back write a comment to everything and then it's closed off and i feel as a resident that i feel like we're trying to do all this engagement but how do we know that anything we've said other than just getting these comments at the end so my, my question is twofold one is how long is this process when do you realistically see this whole process playing out to the point where you decide to adopt something number two um, what points will we as the public be informed that maybe there were changes or things are changing? And number three, is it just a case where we make a bunch of comments after the public hearing, you guys write back why it's all correct, and then that's the end of it? That's my fear. Um, 
Right. So I, I can't put a time frame around the last steps or, or from beyond October 20th, because that's not a decision that we can put into play. I can tell you, Suzanne, that there are comments, including some that you have made to me, that, you know, they will be answered in the FEIS because they are, in my mind, substantive comments that we need to address. I don't, this is a town project. We are not just going to say, oh, it's in there and too bad. When, when Ivy says we are taking your comments to heart and looking at this process genuinely, it's because you guys are, are helping us making sure that what we're looking at looks at everything. And so, so I can't answer the timeframes, but I can give you assurance that comments that I've heard, even though we're not at the public hearing yet, you know, I've put ticklers in my copies of documents because I think it's important. You know, because because everybody is up here in, in under the the auspice of what is best for the community and in the public interest. It's because my concern is that uh, that we'll make a comment. We, we will go out. We'll have our things and you will answer it. I'm sure you'll answer it. I have no doubt about that. But but there's making a comment and answering it. And then there's something. Something. You 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 blanked out. Her mic is still open. Gotta love technology. Let me address sort of one of one of Suzanne's questions. It's been, it's been an issue that's popped up about the taxes for schools. And uh, I spoke with uh, Jen uh, Jennifer Gray. I spoke with you, Sabrina, today as well. Um, if, for example, the public land was sold, and if the referendum or no referendum impacted that, and ultimately a, a developer comes and, and builds. We can dictate now how those properties on public land would be taxed. Is that that's correct, Jennifer? So the process would be, you know, in the event that the town board um, decides to sell or lease its its land, um, obviously you would enter into a contract of sale, same as the you know the, the sale of any property. In that contract of sale, the town board would have the ability to um, to negotiate terms. And those terms could include certain development parameters. So even though five stories uh, would be authorized by zoning code, the town board could decide in the contract of sale, we only wanna see a four story building. here. We only wanna see a three story building. And th those would be terms upon which the sale would be conveyed. Um, does that answer? And, and that could include, um, uh, you know, so whether the, the, the units are, are fee simple, um, you know, did certain tax implications as well. And that's important. And that's an issue that's been raised repeatedly. So, so that's something that could be protected as, as, as any part of any type of potential development should a future town board make a decision to sell and a public referendum that's uh, permissible uh, allows it to go through that as a contingent piece of it, the taxes are fee simple. Thank you. Okay, 10 minutes and two more questions to go. We have a person on the phone, uh, you, the last four numbers of your, your cell phone are uh, 7828. Your line should be open. Hang on one moment. Just trying to get you off mute right now. Sorry, I'm just checking if there's something else that has to get pressed. Sabrina, very quickly, what, while you're while we're waiting, you mentioned before the working group, and you said you work with the de development community. You were referencing the people in town who live here who have a building or buildings. Yes, yes, actually, uh, residents who are also property owners, uh, commercial developers. Thank you. For example, the owner of the Susan Lawrence building. Correct. I'm sorry, I'm Googling as fast as I can. I'm 
Just going to put the phone number on hold for one more moment, and I'm going to let the next person speak while I figure that out. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, Joanna. Uh, Hi. Coogan is my last name. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Joanna. Hi. So, there's been a lot of discussion about market demand and, you know, the fact that this is not a construction project, which I agree. This is not a comprehensive plan. This is more, we're gonna let a developer come in and do what they want within these parameters. And I think I agree with the previous callers that we can just make the assumption that they are going to do develop as much as they possibly can. My question really is, can you guys articulate to us, what's the benefit to us as residents as current residents here of providing this housing um, when my understanding about the markets is that they will never reach what they used to be. There's always, we want high demand in town. Isn't that the case that we want our homes to be of high value? And then if we're adding a ton of development downtown, we're investing in that, but we're not investing in the businesses downtown. Are, I'm assuming that all of this new development will come with very high rents for local businesses. I'd rather see my tax money and my uh, our efforts going towards revitalizing the businesses and helping the businesses that are there. So I guess my question is, what what made you th what what is the rationale behind we need to provide a ton of condominiums down, downtown so i'll start i see i see everybody's like we want to tell you we want to tell you um so i'll start and then everybody else can jump in too um so you know the the rationale behind this right is that we want to be able to create housing that will bring more people into our hamlet so that we have more people living and working and shopping and dining downtown. And when we have those kind of feet on the street, as it were, then we get to a critical mass where we're able to support the small businesses that we have in our downtown today and perhaps grow them. And I don't mean exponential growth. I mean, having a couple of more restaurants that we can go to on a Friday night when we have date night, having a place where you can go to get an ice cream cone in the evening on the summers. So we're, we're talking about being able to create that kind of critical mass that, that will sustain and drive additional retail business within our Hamlet. So this is really a way of, of strengthening our existing small businesses um, by giving them that, that kind of critical mass living and working downtown. And we do know from our comprehensive plan process that there is a demand for a product that doesn't exist in our community today. So we have housing in our community today and it's really clustered in this like really narrow band of single family homes, which are all, you know, right around a million dollars, a million one, a million two. And, and that's the product that exists today, right? And we want to be able to meet the demands that we know exist out there because we've done the market analysis for- and What are there other towns that you've seen that this works in that, that, that have the school system that we have that have the, 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 a similar situation to, to us that you've seen this work? Jeremy, you look like you wanted to jump in. <laughs> let me let me get to something first. Um, sort of to address that, but backwards. If there is no again, if there's no market for it, the you know saying it will it work? No one's going to build. You know, it's not just all of a sudden a developer. That's not true. Developers are probably they're already buying up buildings around here because they think it's going to work. Okay. They're they're their own. They want. I understand why a developer would want to do this. I'm asking, why do we need this okay. much housing downtown, five stories, adding all of this traffic when we haven't even invested in our businesses downtown? So, so if you allow um, current businesses or what part of current landowners or property owners, where those business are, the businesses are, where the commercial tenant is bearing the cost of all of that tax, um, you bring in residential on top, certainly. It's going to increase the tax because there's more value to it, but it's also going to be divided and up amongst 
more than just that one commercial taxpayer. Um, you're not competing. You mentioned before about compete. We have all these homes now. We want to keep the stock, the value high. These one and two bedroom, presumably apartments or condos, whatever you want to call them for now, are not competing with the four four bedroom home. So it's gonna have little impact on on those homes. But an empty nester who someone doesn't want to pay those significant property taxes, but wants to stay in the community. And, and Chapel Crossing, frankly, is going to be not cheap. That's going to be extremely expensive. Now have some housing stock where they can live because they don't need the land anymore. Um, there's no value. You know, talk about the value to you. There's no value in having empty storefronts in a hodge, yeah. you can use hodgepodge of buildings downtown in the Hamlet now. There's right, but this is not a plan to, to help the small business because presumably the rents on these new condominiums where the storefronts are going to be are going to be significantly more expensive um and so you know i don't think that helps a small business at all suddenly we're going to be looking at only a gap is going to be able to afford to be here well, you know I encourage you, I encourage you to speak to to a lot of the local business owners and i'm sure there's some who don't like it but the, the, I think the most that I've, I've spoken with certainly do like it and are, are, are supportive of it. And there's a reason why they're supportive of it. So I think before you make that statement. Well, I have been talking to business owners. I, that's the reason this is, I'm bringing this up because I'm not, I'm, I'm just not seeing the logic yet. I don't understand this. This is a massive piece of legislation. And I really am not seeing a solid argument behind it yet. I just am not. So um, I'm sure there's somebody else waiting to talk and we can touch more on this. Thanks, Joanna. I appreciate your comments and I'll take that as a challenge. <laughs> um, and uh, we have uh, one, the, the, the caller who was the dial-in person with the 7828 number. Um, Carrie, if we could just really briefly bring that person off of Sure, board. you just need to dial star six. We'll unmute your microphone. And yes, hi, in. this is Ellen Adnipos. Can you hear me? Hi, Ellen. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, hi. Hi, in the effort of time, I'm going to be very, very brief. First of all, I have been very supportive of our town board, and that's not what this is about. But I am not on Facebook. And I think many people are no longer on Facebook. I, I really had no idea that any of this was going on. I heard something that, you know, this was comparing us to what was going on in Greenberg, in Yorktown, in Ossining. I'm sorry, I don't see any comparison. Greenberg does not have a downtown, nor does Yorktown. Uh, I think that there's so much retail and all of these apartments that are going to be built up in Mount Kisco and Pleasantville. I've lived here 35 years. I am an empty nester. I'm happy to be, and I've been proud to call this community my home. But I really hope that there'll be a longer time frame. I hope that more people will be able to become engaged because, frankly, I don't think people know about this. I mentioned this to a couple of my friends who are not on Facebook, and they had no idea that this was going on. So I don't know if there's a way that you can slow down this process, but I, I really hope that you will be listening to all of us. Uh, my husband and I both have commuted into New York. People will be going back to commute to New York, absolutely. And getting out of that train station is a nightmare, and that's right now. So I really hope that somehow you can try to slow down this process and really try to keep this town. I, I understand that I know what a developer does. I'm quite aware, but I, I really am concerned about this. And as I said, you guys have done a great job. This is no way, you know, that's not what my comments are about. But people, I don't think in our community know that this is happening. So thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. And I, I do want to say that we also, this is well before it was just on Facebook, it's been in e-newsletters, you know, start, starting with Rob Greenstein and with, with uh, Ivy Poole. So it's been probably referenced dozens of times. I don't remember the exact number was. We, we tried to calculate it. We did. Um, moreover, there was inserts, either I believe at least once or maybe twice, 
uh, in water bills that were sent out referencing this. So it was actually in, in snail mail as well. Um, so it's not as if it's it's not been put out there. Unfortunately, you know, we can always do better, but unfortunately also people need to pay attention and be involved. And this is why in part, we're making this bigger push now. I'm not blaming anyone. We all have to do a better job, but it has been out there. Um, so thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate everybody sticking with us. This was a longer than anticipated call, but it's it's actually really quite exciting that people are so um, you know involved and engaged in this process. And um, you know, it's it's hard to facilitate these calls because I see so many people raising their hand, and I wish that I could get to everybody. Um, and I you know sometimes I, I stumble over when is the right time to uh, to jump in and and try to move people along. Um, you know, please, if you didn't get a chance to speak or if if you didn't get the answer that you were looking for, the engagement that you were looking for, um, please call us, please email us. We are responding to emails. We really want to take the opportunity and the time to make people aware of what it is that we're working on. And we are listening to feedback and we are thinking about, you know, what changes need to be made, if any. And and really it's, it's like I said, you know, we're, our hearts and our minds are open. And so please just continue to engage with us. And so with that said, um, I just wanna remind everybody that we have our third and final um, community engagement session coming up next Thursday, October 15th. Uh, that one is in the morning, I believe it is at 11 a.m. And uh, you can sign up again to be a part of that um, on chatforward.org. It's and at 10 a.m. It's at 10 a.m. Thank you, thank goodness. Thank goodness I have you 10 a.m. So please sign up. Um, please join us. Uh, if you miss it, you can you can follow along um, afterwards uh, with the videos that we're, we're posting on chapbuckboard.org. And thank you again, everyone, for, for your time and for your passion and for your commitment to this town. We appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Sabrina. Thank you, Carrie. Good night. Good night.